Okay. Volume up a little bit higher. Just a little bit higher again. <clears throat> right. There we go. So, uh, well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are listening and watching this here. Um, my name is Andrew Richardson, uh, and I'll be going over today uh, one of my research papers. It's one of the research papers I co-authored on. Uh, this was published um, in September 2020, led by uh, Justin Kotze, myself, and then Georges Antonopoulos. This was submitted to the journal Performance Enhancement Health, entitled Looking Acceptably Feminine, a Single Case Study of a Female Bodybuilder's Use of Steroids. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read through it all and then expand on a little bit more for, for the readers and listeners. Um, this article aims to shed some light on the motivations for and methods of female steroid consumption uh, and also the broader changes in female body image ideals. Moreover, the study attempts to explore the connections between the competitive logic of liberal postmodern consumer capitalism, competitive femininity and steroid use. There's a growing consensus that an increasing number of women are consuming steroids, yet this phenomenon remains relatively under-researched and as such not much is known about this particular group of users. Utilising a single in-depth case study interview, this paper offers some, scroll down, some additional insights gleaned from an ethnographic interview with a female bodybuilder who uses steroids. Her narrative included some of the risks, harms, and motivations for steroid consumption, alongside broader changes in female body image ideals. Among the central findings, the paper highlights that the female bodybuilder is not resisting cultural norms, but rather hyper-conforming to them by an over-identifying with a hyper-idealized form of what constitutes, constitutes yes, uh, acceptable femininity. We conclude that the steroid consumption retains a strong connection to the desire for aesthetic appeal and that both short and long-term motivations for using steroids are grounded in the drive for conformity. This has pertinent clinical implications for health professionals, particularly in relation to the efficacy of attempts to reduce steroid consumption by warning users of the potential adverse health effects. So, again, going into the intro, Fitness rather than health has undoubtedly become the contemporary standard to be met in the 21st century. The aesthetic dimension of the body now takes front and center stage against the backdrop of the changing currency of body ill capital as the body itself becomes a site of consumption. Moreover, health psychologist Grogan points out that the current millennium physical attractiveness carries with its symbolic cues that predispose a sense of social comp competence. Indeed, the firm term body is seen as representing success, a view mirrored in the almost ubiquitous stream of fitspiration content flooding social media. In this context, where the fine tune of one's body remains for many the last vestige of control, ultimately failure comes in the form of being perceived as overweight. This pressure is borne by both men and women, and some growing numbers respond to this pressure by consuming body image drugs, among which is steroids or anabolic steroids, and steroids is probably known best or best known. Anabolic androgenic steroids, hereafter steroids for the context of this piece, are synthetic substances that simultaneously stimulate tissue building and skeletal muscle growth and the development of masculinization properties. Evidence suggests that the consumption of steroids has substantially increased over the, over the last several decades and that the most popular forms of steroids are among the most counterfeited image and performance enhancing drugs. All evidence internationally indicates that the majority of anabolic steroid users are male with the highest levels of use of those aged between 20 to 40 years of age. This has remained unchanged since the 1990s. Although steroid use is common amongst men and the prevalence amongst women is more difficult to estimate, there's a growing consensus that an increasing number of women are consuming steroids. However, whilst it is acknowledged that more women are using steroids, not much is known about this group of users. Research studies have found it particularly difficult to recruit female steroid users, principally because they are much rarer than their male counterparts. The aim of the study is to shed some light on the motivations for and methods of female steroid consumption um, 
and looking at the broad changes in female body image ideals. Moreover, the study attempts to explore the connections between the competitive logic of liberal postmodern consumer capitalism, competitive femininity, and steroid use. In studying phenomena of comparative rarity, Pearson and Hobbes demonstrate how a single exploratory case study can often yield useful insights. Indeed, the utility of single case study research has been well documented and is for this reason that it is being adopted here. In the pages that follow, we present the findings of a single in-depth ethnographic interview with a female bodybuilder who we have called Lisa. We do not, of course, claim that Lisa is a representative of all female bodybuilders or that her consumption of steroids is typical of women in the sport. Instead, the findings presented here are of interest precisely because they contribute to a body of knowledge characterized by its scarcity or scarcity and because they may have some analytical generalizability. That is to say that perhaps by exploring to uh, to analogously broader context towards this end is perhaps instructive to explore wider context of female bodybuilding and steroid consumption. But first, let's offer an account of the methods and data used in this article. So section two, methods and data. <coughs> Pardon me. Data presented in this article are the product of ongoing research in steroid use and trade in the locale of the northeast of England, which, one of the, which has one of the highest rates of steroid use in the UK. The primary research site has been a gym in which the use and trade of steroids is widespread. Data have also been collected at four fine events, four bodybuilding competitions and two product promotion events in the area. Within the context of this ongoing research, we have interviewed, among others, 26 steroid users, 25 male and one female. Steroid users attend specific venues, most probably gyms, regularly in a disciplined fashion as part of their training regime and consumption patterns. Having joined a gym, we began regularly attending and over time formed relationships with fellow gym attendees who were steroid users and or dealers. This made access particularly straightforward during the ethnography, where in many cases our initial participants introduced us to other users. Interviews were conducted as a free-flowing conversation with participants on a series of occasions. For some of the interviews, tape recording was possible, for the, but for the vast majority, this was impractical. This largely depended on the time of the hour of the interview, the space in which the interview took place, and the mood of the interv interviewee. We were also cautious because of our past experiences conducting empirical criminological research have led us to believe that the interviewer-interviewee relationship the interviewing process and the breadth and quality of data collected can significantly improve it if a tape slash digital recorder is avoided. Instead, we use notebooks either during or immediately after the interview had finished. A memorized interview guide was used during all during for all the interviews conducted as part of this research. This memorized interview guide covered a number of general topics, including motivations for use, sources of merchandise, people involved in steroid trade, etc. For the current article, the single case study of a female steroid user, there were effectively no inclusion criteria. Data from the only female participant was used. The interview data as a resource tradition was used to reflect the interviewee's reality about the, the topic at hand. Accounts from this interview were subjected to discussion and consensus, consensus between us. Powerful and vi vivid extract examples from the data were selected to highlight accounts put forward. The participant was not involved in an analytical process, which was the case for other participants who have taken part in the study. Our study presents some limitations which should be acknowledged at this stage. Firstly, during ethnographic research, there can be no guarantee that the information given is a wholly neutral representation of the activities and actors. One needs to remember that accounts offered in ethnographic study are consciously or unconsciously interpreted by the researcher. Moreover, the data are, is limited to what the participants have provided and what the researcher has observed, and perhaps they cannot easily be generalised to the broader steroid user scene. The count from the single female participant most certainly cannot be used to generalise the whole female steroid use in population. In relation to the interview with our female participant, as in the case with the other participants in the overall project, one can never be absolutely certain about validity, although member checking the process in which collected data is played back to the informant to check for perceived accuracy and reactions, significantly contribute towards eliminating untruthful accounts. Ethic approval for the research was granted by university's research ethics committee. Needless to say, consent forms were neither provided to nor signed to, to our participants because of the sensitive nature of the research. However, it should be mentioned 
that all participants were verbally informed about the purpose and nature of our research, as well as their rights as participants to put forward by the Code of Ethics of the British Society of Criminology, including the right to not participate, to withdraw at any stage of the interview, and have their identity protected at all stages of the research process and beyond. Section 3. Female bodybuilding, steroids and resistance. Since the 1980s, interest in female bodybuilding has grown significantly. This growing interest has spawned an array of competitive events, each with their own categories, regulations and requirements that are strictly monitored and to which women must conform if they want to compete. Alongside this increase in women's competitions, we have seen an increase in female bodybuilders consumption of sorry, female bodybuilders consuming steroids. This is perhaps unsurprising because there is a mountain of evidence to suggest that it's not only is steroid use encouraged in bodybuilding, but is deemed necessary to compete. Indeed, Grogan and Al pointed out that steroids are so ingrained in the bodybuilding culture that natural bodybuilding competitions have been set up specifically for competitors who choose not to take steroids. According, accordingly, the argument can certainly be advanced, and we shall develop this a bit more in a moment, that the sport of competitive bodybuilding is deeply in integrated into the ideological core of neoliberalism. Its participants dem demonstrate a deep commitment to the competitive individualism, immediate gratification, and the cultivation of envy that reside right at the heart of neoliberalism, and therefore conform to rather than deviate from its cultural values and central tenets. There can be little doubt that the works, that the, the little doubt that steroids work in facilitating this hyperconformity. However, there are a number of adverse effects. That must be considered, particularly in the light of the fact that women are more vulnerable to many of the negative effects of steroids. Among the most common negative effects identified by the literature are increased facial and body hair, deepening of the voice, reduced breast size, menstrual disturbances, clitoral men mengeli, and se severe mood changes. It is also suggested that women tend to downplay long-term serious side effects, often minimizing them in relation to the positive effects on their body image. Indeed, Grogan et al. noted that the adverse uh, effects of most concern to women were those that had a direct effect on body image and fertility. Yet despite such risk, studies have found that female steroid users often report intentions to continue using, perhaps because the potential long-term health risks are outweighed by the, the desire to acquire the immediate aesthetic gains necessary for competition. This preference for prioritizing short-term aesthetic gain over long-term health is emblematic of the capitalist injunction to eschew deferred gratification and enjoy now quickly acquire the appropriate feminine look required in order to increase the chances of winning competitive events. It is certainly cast doubt over discourse that position female bodybuilding as challenging or resisting mainstream cultural ideals. Nevertheless, these narratives of resistance still have a relatively strong presence in the literature on female bodybuilding, perhaps because bodybuilding and muscularity are often seen as inappropriate for women. Therefore, women who aim for a muscular physique are transgressing current Western cultural norms. For some, female bodybuilders challenge the representation of women as physically weak and the common tendency to associate traits such as muscularity and strength with m masculinity. For others, positioning female bodybuilders as the radical cutting edge of feminist resistance to cultural ideals as a somewhat optimistic view. Indeed, rather than representing the hard kernel of resistance, it's possible that female bodybuilding is simply another way of persuading women to change their bodies in line with a cultural ideal that stresses the importance of avoiding fleshiness. This less optimistic view certainly accords with contemporary interpretations of body image, which tend to position the muscular tone and strong looking body as a new aesthetic ideal. It is within this context that Grogan argues that female bodybuilders are both resistant and complying with mainstream social pressures. They are simultaneously resisting cultural norms by becoming unacceptably muscular and conforming to a narrow set of ideals determined by the bodybuilding community. This argument is certainly compelling. However, we would argue that female bodybuilders are not resisting cultural norms, but rather hyper-conforming to them by the over-identifying with a hyper idealized form of what constitutes acceptable femininity. This can be seen from the way in which female bodybuilders dedicate themselves to the production of a bodily aesthetic that conforms to a tightly regulated and commercially defined view of femininity. Athletic but not skinny, toned but not ripped, muscular but not huge. 
Far from resisting culture norms by becoming unacceptably muscular, female bodybuilding is deeply connected to notions of bodily obsession and vanity in ways that reflect tendencies and vulnerabilities found in the broader gendered social world. Therefore, the unacceptable muscular aesthetic which Grogan identifies as a source of resistance is precisely the socio-symbolic display of conformity. This revision must be viewed in the context of recent developments in the idealized forms of body image. That is to say that bodybuilders are not contesting the dominant slender ideal precisely because of this ideal is arguably no longer dominant. Indeed, Grogan points out that the desire for the wallfish thin looking body has given way to a new aesthetic ideal that favours the muscular worked out and strong looking body. According to the act of bodybuilding, the body sorry, according to the act of building the body up rather than scaling it down does not constitute resistance. As Grogan and Al suggest, but rather conformity precisely because this is the new feminine norm. Within the context of competitive female bodybuilding, this norm is hyper-idealized. Competitors are required to over-identify with this new aesthetic injunction and in doing so display a hyper-conformity to a highly commercialized and tightly regulated conception of the acceptable feminine body image. In this way, the act of building the body up is undertaken precisely to be more competitively feminine, to adhere more closely to a set of predefined specifications, um, so as to increase their chances of winning events. As we've seen, it is within this context that steroids is not considered deviant, but rather expected and necessary for competition. This description to what we call competitive femininity is an is intimately connected to the competitive logic of liberal postmodern consumer capitalism. Indeed, accounts of female bodybuilders often present data that reveals this, but rarely makes the connection explicit. Nevertheless, even a curiosity scan reveals narratives steeped in the drive for symbolic capital. The cultivation of envy in others, competitive individualism, immediate gratification, and short-termism. This hyper-conformative competitive Femininity is therefore in no way antagonistic to mainstream cultural norms and values. Rather, it has been found with male steroid users. The opposite is not true as much as many demonstrate a deep commitment to the commercially defined and highly competitive ideal of an appropriately feminine body image. Certainly, in Lisa's case, her route into bodybuilding did not begin from a desire to challenge cultural perceptions of women, but precisely to conform to them. Indeed, like many other women who are more likely to exercise for aesthetic reasons rather than for health, Lisa began exercising because I was again a bit chubby, and after gradually introducing weights into what was predominantly a cardio-based routine, Lisa progressed through quite a few gyms before arriving at what she called a bodybuilding gym. Section 4. Bulking up and looking good. Lisa is now a competitive bodybuilder in her mid-twenties and has a very muscular and athletic physique. On the subject of body image ideals, Lisa was quite candid about her own experience. She says, When I was 16, I wanted to be as thin as possible. I wanted thin legs. I wanted thin arms. I was like, what, eight stone? At one point, I thought at the time, I looked amazing. I looked like a model. Now when I look back, I'm like, I look ill. And over that time when fitness came to my life, I then wanted big legs. For Lisa, this experience was emblematic of a broader rapid changes in body image ideals. She expressed that as little as four years ago. She said, bodybuilders were too far. Now, oh God, they all want to look like that. They all need to look like that. They need to have these cap delts. They need to have this and that. And it's that need to look a certain way. It's no, long, no longer an extreme. Now, that's the norm. This accords with Grogan's contention that the muscular, worked out and strong looking body is now the new feminine bodily aesthetic to aspire to. However, it is interesting to consider this change not as a cultural U-turn per se, but rather as a process of sculpting a more detailed configuration of the previous ideal. This is a process of fleshing out by adding fine tone detail to the slender silhouette of previous iterations of the ideal feminine female bodily aesthetic. This modified preference for the toned and hard-looking body is not only considered appropriately feminine, but accords with the 21st century's obsession with aesthetic perfect- perfectibility. This is demonstrated beautifully in the world of cinema, where CGI, or computer-generated imagery, is used with increasing favour to achieve full believability through an erasure, an erasure of flaws. The problem is, however, 
that C CGI cinema gives the impression that aesthetic mastery is possible yet, as Manon points out, this poses a problem for the human subject for whom mastery is impossible and perpetual dissatisfaction is con constitutive. The same is true, of course, of the filters used in social media sites such as Instagram and Snapchat, which are used to erase flaws to such an extent that the content often possesses an excessive naturality. Since this constitutes a supernatural aesthetic, unattainable without external aid, it renders the revered bodily form pre-emittedly unnatural. However, natural, natural, uh, however, natural, naturalness is no longer the currency of a bodily capital. What matters is a symbolic capital derived from achieving the required aesthetic. This carries with the intense social pressure to capture flattering selfies of that social media post. Indeed, Lisa commented that people don't realize it when they do it, but their insecurities come out all over Instagram, all over Facebook, because they can't train without taking a video or taking an after selfie, or they have to tell their full workout of that day, what they ate, what they've done. It's almost like they need people's approval in order to, for that to mean something. Here, social media operates as a surrogate big other, verifying the act. This is captured nearly in a popular phrase that Lisa recalled, if you didn't take a selfie, did you even train? Interestingly, interestingly Lisa acknowledges that the inherent uh, velocity of the process is irrelevant so long as one obtains the requisite, the requisite symbolic capital. It doesn't matter how fake it is as long as it's going to get those likes. This is reflected in the ability to buy likes. So basically now they don't even need to do the hard work, just go and buy it and you can get likes. This is particularly interesting in the context of body image precisely because it functions in similar fashion to steroid consumption. That is to say this cyber consumption is undertaken to circumvent deferred gratification and secure quick fix, thereby accelerating one's insta thing. This virtualization of aesthetic pleasure has arguably heightened the drive to attain a bodily aesthetic that not only aligns with, but maximizes a positive sense of self. Indeed, Lisa noted how it used to be about sculpting their body into something that made themselves feel better. Now it's still to make them feel better, but for more different reason. It's almost they do it just to get Insta famous. The motivation for steroid use has been long linked to aesthetic appeal. With the increased a premonition of social media, this motivation has been arguably been increased significantly. Lisa felt that steroids have been consumed to look like the Instagram models, look like because if you look like that fitness model, that Instagram model, if you do all the photo shoots and stuff, people are going to notice you more, they're going to like you more. The more you compete, the more pictures you get in the bikini, the more attention you get for it. So they're going to take them and buy them the steroids for appearance, and the majority of them will take them not knowing the real effects that they have or the la long-lasting effects. This resonated with Lisa's own experience of consuming steroids. Her initial motivations were based upon a desire to transform the body as quickly as possible into an aesthetically pleasing commodity to be enjoyed. That is, to render the body itself as a site of pleasurable consumption. I wanted to get a six pack and then I thought that was the quickest way. I went for the quick fix. Yes, so in the start, it definitely was that quick fix. I wanted to look like this. This was going to get me there quicker. I'm going to take that. Lisa went on to note that I knew I didn't need to take them to get the muscle, but I wanted it quick. So obviously, anabolic steroids, any performance enhancing drugs, they sp speed up the process. However, this early experience was laden with a number of risks that were ex ex exaggerated by a lack of knowledge, as Lisa explains. I started with the Black Mamba, which I then stopped taking because I felt ill on them. Probably didn't take them the way I was supposed to take them. Then I was introduced to Winstrol, which I took on and off for a year. Didn't really take it properly the way you were meant to take it. I didn't really understand cycles, et cetera, et cetera, pardon me. This is when I was in the very early stages of, of my bodybuilding. Beyond various internet Bibles that profess to offer unbiased information, much of the information regarding steroid consumption and its effects are gleaned by beginners from those deemed more experienced and knowledgeable. However, as Wright et al. pointed out, these are often the bigger people in the gyms who think they know what they are telling you is right. This certainly accords with Leeds' account as she described a number of experiences with what Hall, Grogan and Go call lay expertise. I was going by word of mouth by someone who actually really didn't know what they were talking about at all. 
in preparation for a first bodybuilding competition, Lisa told us that. I took prop or testosterone propionate and anovar. My coach was an idiot and introduced me to a whole bad a whole load of other drugs that I didn't actually need to take. I trusted him and I had again going back to what I should look like. I had this in my head. I need to look like this, so I need to take these drugs. So then I started taking an Anavar and I was on 20 milligrams in the end. Whilst, whilst folly pharmacy is a common practice among steroid users, it has been suggested that women are less likely to stack, taking more than one steroid at a time, are more likely to pyramid, gradually increase the dosage, and then tapering down the men. However, this was not reflective of Lisa's experience, who recalled her whole stack uh, of monster preparation for competition. Proveron, I was on 50 milligrams. Arimidex, I was on 10 milligrams of that every other day. T, T3s, tri doth iring should have never have touched them. I can't even remember how much of that I was on. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. I was still on Clem, Clint Buterol, as it's known as, at the same time as well. And instead of cycling all of that, I took that every day for months on end. So again, I wasn't introduced. I knew I should cycle, but I didn't cycle because I listened to someone else who thought knew who I thought knew everything because funny enough, Instagram and Facebook had told me. So I never actually met him in real life. He was my coach who I found through inst Instagram. The effects of this misuse were significant as Lisa expressed that she actually ended up quite unwell, both mentally and phys physically. Mentally, I was body dysmorphic to hell. Physically, I was drained and tired. There was, however, also a pastoral element to steroid coaching, evident in Lisa's narrative. Indeed, there were those she actually did know and actually were interested in keeping me healthy. For example, Lisa recalled how I started learning off one of the other personal trainers who was known as the godfather of steroids. He pretty much knew how to cycle things what was good what was bad basically i was introduced to clan wasn't sure i'd take it so he told me how to take it reference was also made to another coach who basically step step by step took me through how to do it and how to be safe about it this pastoral element was similarly was similar to the social supply evidence by Antonopoulos and Hall, whereby knowledge and product transactions take place devoid of commercial motivations. In absence of easily accessible forms of credible knowledge, this element of pastoral support is salient because, as Lisa notes, when she first started, I didn't even know anything about it, the steroids. At that stage, I was completely innocent of everything, more to the point in recounting her use of Anavar, Proveron, Arimidex, T3s, Clembuterol, and Prima, Cream Prima Bolin. Lisa noted how pretty much all of them were oral bar the Prima Bolin, which was an injection. This is a crucial point because it has been well documented that steroid tablets can be highly toxic. Moreover, oral forms of steroids are removed more solely by a liver, which means all things considered, injecting steroids is actually the safer method of consumption. Yet, as demonstrated by Lisa and supported by the literature out there, women are more likely to consume steroids orally than men. Steroid coaching is evidently part of the bodybuilding culture, but telling the good from the bad can be challenging, particularly for newcomers. Whilst her case does not necessarily support Bjorsen et al. contention that the onset of female steroid use is triggered by men in close relationships, it does not suggest that steroid coaches tend to be men. Furthermore, whilst Lisa's boyfriend did not trigger her use of steroids, she, he does serve her as a coach from whom she draws knowledge. I still learn of people now. The likes of my boyfriend's way more clued up than I am, so I am basically, anything he says, I sit and take it all in. His word's not going to be gospel, but when you take everybody's point of view, you make up your own point of view. In keeping with views expressed in the wider literature, Lisa held a relatively positive view of steroids and perhaps also displayed a tendency to underestimate the, the potential negative effects. As she says, I don't have any issues with steroids as long as they're used appropriately. I just think people need to understand them more, but if you don't understand them, don't take them. There was also no indication that Lisa intended to stop using steroids despite previous negative experiences and potential future health risks. Whilst the motivations for using steroids can be complex and person-specific, 
These are often rooted into the drive to boost one's aesthetic appeal and competitive edge. As we have seen, this is far from representing the green shoots of resistance to dominant cultural ideals. Instead, such motivations demonstrate a deeper commitment to the competitive logic of liberal postmodern consumer capitalism. Again, this cultural backdrop it may be more instructive to view bodybuilding not as a subculture, but as an exaggerated micro microcosm in whose participants over identify with and hyper conform to capitalism's dominant cultural injunctions. Indeed, the almost ubiquitous presence of steroids in bodybuilding perhaps indicates the extent to which the sport is embedded within mainstream consumer capitalism. Steroids are not used as a means of resisting cultural injunctions, but precisely to facilitate one's conformity to them. This is evident throughout much of the literature and throughout Lisa's narrative. What is interesting is that this drive for conformity is evident in both short and long term motivations. As already mentioned, her initial motiva motivations were rooted in a desire for immediate gratification and the cultivation of envy in others, mirroring the dominant injunction to skew long term considerations in favour of short term gains. Long term motivations, however, were rooted in the desire to maintain or perhaps even exceed the desired aesthetic and competitive edge. As Lisa goes on to say, Generally, it was the quick fix I went for, but now my reasons are about distance. Now it's for the, the specific effects that can offer me accompanying what I do in the gym with my nutritionist. Representations of female bodybuilding as a resistance certainly be read and much more critically, particularly in light of the considerable constraints imposed by the bodybuilding community regarding acceptable degrees of muscularity. Indeed, as we have tried to argue here, it is perhaps more fruitful to view aspects of female bodybuilding as a means of hyper-conforming to mainstream cultural ideals. This is perhaps further demonstrated by research findings which suggest that competitive female bodybuilders demonstrate greater body dissatisfaction compared to recreational weight lifters by Goldfield. Additionally, weight is added when these findings are viewed in conjunction with those to connect female bodybuilding with bodily obsession and vanity. For Lisa, this seemed to resonate quite strongly. I think people who don't compete in the sport or don't really take much interest in participating in the sport, they probably live a, ha a happier life in terms of they don't really care what they look like as much. Whereas you get into bodybuilding, you get yourself into better shape. But once you get in that better shape that you thought you wanted, you, you end up, no, this isn't good enough. I don't like that bit. I don't like this, that that bit is holding too much fat that's not strong enough and you just sit there and pick and pick and pick you pick because you're always going to be your worst critic because you can't see what other people can see this constant picking and perceived defects or flaws is certainly characteristic of body dysmorphic disorder or more specifically the subtype muscle dysmorphia Although often discussed as a, as a psychiatric disorder, we could perhaps consider this phenomenon much more broadly in relation to a sense of subjective lack, which consumer, cons consumer capitalism both cultivates and promises yet always fails to alleviate. Indeed, it could be argued that the long-term health risks associated with steroid consumption are outweighed by the short-term aesthetic gain, precisely because the attainment of bodily improvement promises to help alleviate this sense of a subjective lack. If this is the case, then it has serious clinical impl implications. At the very least, it suggests that we may need to re rethink prevention strategies that are designed to reduce steroid consumption by warning users of the potential adverse health effects while space precludes further analysis of this here. Further research could be directed towards unpicking this in more detail. Section five, conclusion. The aesthetic dimension of bodily capital has been obtained, has obtained a new position of, of, salience, of salience in the 21st century. Our obsession with aesthetically perfect ability and virtualization of aesthetic pleasure has placed in interest and increased pressure on the need to maximize one's one body image. In the milieu where poor body image signals the ultimate failure, it's perhaps unsurprising to find that, pardon me, to find that the consumption of image and performance enhancing drug use drugs such as steroids is increasing whilst also and often associated with men there's a growing consensus that female steroid consumption is growing this growth has arguably occurred in tandem with an increase in women's participation in competitive bodybuilding a sport within which steroid use is both encouraged and deemed necessary to compete the 
ubiquitous extent to which sports deeply integrate into the ideological circuitry of neoliberalism. Indeed, its participants demonstrate a deep commitment to liberal postmodern consumer capitalism's core values and tenets, which are competitive individualism, the cultivation of envy, immediate gratification and short termism. Nobody in our case study of Lisa supported the view that female bodybuilding represent a form of resistance to mainstream cultural ideals. Instead, her narrative seemed to support the view that bodybuilding should not be viewed as a subculture, but rather than as an exaggerated microcosm whose participants over identify with a hyper idealized form of what now constitutes acceptable femininity. As the wider literature suggests, as our case study has highlighted, the new feminine norm is not the slender silhouette of yesteryear, but rather the worked out muscular and strong looking body. This more detailed configuration of the ideal female bodily aesthetic resonated with Lisa and arguably stimulated her consumption of steroids, both as a means of attaining it quickly and maintaining it once achieved. Yet, as demonstrated here, there are a number of significant risks that accompany steroid consumption main of which may be exa exaggerated by placing too much stock in the lay expertise of steroid coaches. However, there was also a more pastoral element to steroid coaching, evident in Lisa's narrative, which is important to highlight here because of the role it played in reducing some of the risks associated with her methods of consumption. Indeed, this may prove all the more important because Lisa gave no indication that she intended to stop using steroids despite previous negative experiences and potential future health risks. There remains comparably little research on female steroid users, and there's certainly a need for additional empirical and theoretical work in this area, work that could have significant clinical implications. Previous research has shown that there are several adverse effects experienced by female steroid users, such as menstrual irregularities, deepening of the voice, and clitoral enlargement. However, steroid users are reluctant to talk about steroid use and the negative effects to outsiders. Advice is very rarely, if at all, sought from medical professionals, which makes steroid users a hard to reach group by these professionals, and female users may be in an even harder to reach group. As an anti-doping policy has shifted and become more punitive, the distribution of steroids has moved from dealers embedded in the sporting subculture to a range of non-experts, which leaves users at a greater risk. The internet provides an abundant opportunities for such non-expert suppliers active in the steroid market, offering mechanisms used to target those who lack contracts in the local gym culture, contracts and contacts. Obtaining a better understanding of females' motivations to use steroids and their preferred methods of consumption, it is essential in preventing harm and mitigating the range of negative experiences of female users. However, the range of negative experiences of female users, however, sorry, uh, um, mitigating the range of negative experiences of female users. However, the findings of this article suggest that the efficacy of attempts by the healthcare profession to reduce steroid consumption by warning users of the potential of adverse health effects should be reconsidered. More research should be directed towards exploring the link between body dysmorphic disorders and the subjective lack cultivated by liberal postmodern consumer capitalism. If more is known about this harmful sym symbiosis, then perhaps more targeted clinical interventions can be mobilized to greater effect. And no authors uh, have any declarations of interest to report. Uh, all references will be posted in the comments in the, the video and the link to the paper as well. We put into the bio and comments section of it. The three authors details are Justin Cotsey. He's a senior lecturer in criminology and criminal justice at Teesside University, United Kingdom. He was awarded his PhD in 2016 and has previously published work on the historical, so, historical sublimation of violence, the consumption of steroids as a means of boosting body capital, and the com commodification of abstinence. He is also the author of The Myth of the Crime Decline, Exploring Change and Continuity in Crime and Harm, Rutledge 2019, and co-editor of Zemiology, Reconnecting Crime and Social Harm, Paul Grave 2018. Justin it was the lead author of this piece. The, the, the second author or the second co-author is myself, 
and I'm a PhD student at Teesside University in the social in the School of Social Sciences, Humanities and Law in the United Kingdom. My research interests cover image and performance enhancing drug use, health inequalities, sedentary lifestyles, and esports. And I've recently published published work entitled Anabolic Androgenic Steroids Users AAS Use, Negative Effects, Code of Science, and Implications for Forensic and Medical Professionals, which we'll go into next video. And the third author in this is Georges Antonopoulos, is a professor of criminology at TSA University in the United Kingdom, and his research interests include organized crime and illegal markets, and he is the editor-in-chief of the Trends in Organized Crime Journal. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this is more or less me just reading out the actual paper here. Um, I will do another video on this one where I'll just go into a bit more detail and really just pull apart the actual paper itself and draw on the literature of the other references we've used throughout. So this is very much uh, thinking as you were just listening to if you were reading the paper your your yourself but i hope you enjoyed it any comments feedback just put them in the the comment section on the on the video on youtube or if it's within a class setting just just fire me an email as well but again thank you very much for listening and have a great day